Are low omega threes worse than smoking cigarettes? <laughs> um, I don't know that they're worse. So, omega three fatty acids are you know they're essential for many things, and um, I think you're referring to one specific study that came out of uh, Dr. Bill Harris's group. He's the head of the Fatty Acid Research Institute, and he's actually the pioneer of the omega three index test which is how you should measure your omega-3 levels. Um, they're measured in our red blood cells rather than what you'll 99% of the time find if you get an omega-3 test, it's plasma levels. So red blood cells take about 120 days to turn over, so it's a long-term marker of your omega-3. Whereas if you go and get an omega-3 plasma test, it's kind of like, well, what did I eat for dinner in the last week, right? So you, you may have had a bunch of salmon, but maybe you don't usually eat salmon. So so anyways, the omega-3 index is a way to measure omega-3 levels. And he had done a study looking at omega-3 levels and what's called all-cause mortality. So people dying from all sorts of non-accidental causes. Cardiovascular disease, disease is always at the top of the list because that's pretty much what everyone's dying of. That's like the number one cause of uh, death in most developed countries. And so um, he was looking at all-cause mortality and correlating that with the omega-3 index, which essentially is measuring omega-3 fatty acid levels. And um, what he found was that, so people that have a low omega-3 index, so that would be 4% or less, ha and then comparing it to people that had a high omega-3 index, so that would be 8% or higher. So people that had the high omega-3 index had a five-year increased life expectancy compared to people with the low. Now, people in the United States on average have about a 4 to 5% omega-3 index. So it's pretty, pretty, standard, pretty standard, I would say, in terms of like what people in the U.S. have in terms of their, their omega-3 versus Japan, where they eat a lot of seafood. Their omega-3 index is like 10%. So, and they have a five-year increased life expectancy, by the way, compared to people in the United States. Um, so what he also did, uh, him and his, his colleagues, looked at, they stratified the, the data and looked at other, other factors, physical activity, you know, BMI, smoking. And this is where it got super interesting because, um, and I, I, I just, the graph of this data does it like more ju justice, you know, because you can visually see it. But he looked at all-cause mortality, and people that like lived the longest were, of course, the high omega-3 index with no smoking, right? So like non-smokers. They had the longest life expectancy. And then people with the lowest life expectancy were smokers with a low omega-3 index. But then when he looked at people that smoked but had a high omega-3 index, either they're eating a lot of fish or supplementing, they had the same life expectancy as people with low omega-3 but didn't smoke. So in other words... Having a low omega-3 index was like smoking with respect to all-cause mortality. And that's, you know, and of course, I get all the smokers out there going, oh, so all I have to do is supplement with omega-3. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's the wrong way to think about it. You know, I think, I think most people now know smoking is terrible for your health. And it, and it goes back to this idea, this framework that I like to think about nutrition, which is what do we need, right? Instead of like, always focusing on what to avoid. Because if you focus on what to avoid, you still may not be getting what you need to run your metabolism, to run, you know, neurotransmitter synthesis and all of that. So omega-3 fatty acids are hugely important for many things, and we could talk hours for that. But with respect to smoking, it's really quite, you know, it's it, it's kind of astounding when you just look at that graph and they're like overlaid where you're like, oh, wow, non-smokers are with low omega-3 are living as long as smokers with high omega-3. Do you think that this is a direct cause of the omega-3s or is there some healthy user bias that's upstream from the kinds of people who are the kinds of people that are like people that will have omega-3s in their diet? Great question. So um, with this type of data, which is observational data, it's always a correlation. So you can never you know, definitively say it's cause, right? A causation. So yes, there could be, it could be a healthy user bias. There were other factors that were accounted for, but I will say this. Smoking, everyone thinks about smoking and lung cancer or like cancer risk, right? The, actually, the biggest problem with smoking is heart disease. It is a huge, it's so when you, so here's the thing that I like to think about, like with respect to smoking and disease risk. Smoking in a dose dependent manner will increase your risk for lung cancer. So, in other words, the more cigarettes that you smoke, the higher the risk of cancer. But it's not a linear increase with respect to cardiovascular disease and heart attack risk. 
So you can just have a little bit of cigarettes and your your heart disease risk skyrockets. And omega-3 is one of the biggest things that it protects against is heart disease, right? Doctors prescribe it. So there's been randomized controlled trials where people are given high dose omega-3, purified omega-3, um, in the form of either EPA, which is one of the marine sources, or a combination of DHA and EPA. Um, and, and, and a variety of studies have shown that like heart attack risk, um, risk of, of dying from cardi- cardiovascular disease is dramatically lower in people that are given omega-3s compared to a placebo. So, you know, the fact that the the non-smokers with um, a low omega-3 index are probably affected, it's affecting their cardiovascular health. Mm. Inflammation is a big, also a big driver of cardiovascular disease. And omega-3s are really good at lowering inflammation in many different ways. So, yeah, to, to sort of the long-winded you know, answer to your question is, no, you can't definitively say that healthy user bias isn't involved. But there's a but mechanism that we could see how it would work. There is. And, you know, again, there is adjustment for other health factors. So you would think that that would show up. Let's say that someone goes, I hadn't even thought about omega-3s. I should probably optimize those. What's the 80-20 of getting good omega-3s in your diet? Someone might struggle with seafood. It's kind of hard or expensive to cook at home. Where would you send them for getting it from diet, getting it from supplementation? What do they need to know? So I think um, I talked about the omega-3 index. And again, you want to get 8% or higher. It's always good to measure things. But there's been studies done where people with a low omega-3 index, so the standard American, basically 4%, if you give them about 2 grams a day of omega-3, they can raise their omega-3 index from 4% to 8%. So that would be a supplemental form. Pretty 2 grams. So I'll just give you to give you some perspective, you know, physicians prescribe um, what's Leveza, which is a DHA and EPA ethyl ester form. We can talk about different forms of omega-3, um, of omega-3. And they also prescribe uh, Visipa, which is a highly pure EPA form. And they prescribe them at gra- um, in the gram dose of four grams per day. So that's twice as much as two grams a day, which so I'm, what, what I'm getting at, it's a fairly safe dose. And um, so two grams a day can raise people from 4% to 8%. I think that's a really good sort of just starting point or the average person. Now, I take experimentally higher doses, but, but you know, I think generally speaking, it's pretty safe for most people to take two grams a day and you're going to get that high omega-3 index at 8%. Where are they going to go? How are they going to assess without getting some Norwegian farmer that's squeezing fish into a barrel <laughs> and, and doing it holistically himself? What can you say about assessing the quality of I, I even remember cod liver oil tablets back in the day. There's all sorts of uproar before there was even a podcasting universe to kind of scrutinize it. What do people need to know if they're choosing their omega-3 supplement? I think choosing omega-3 supplement is, um, we actually have a lot of data nowadays. And we have access to that data quite easily because there's a lot of third-party testing sites that go out and they just randomly get fish oil supplements off the grocery store shelves. And they say, I'm going to take this supplement and I'm going to measure important things. I'm going to measure the concentration of the omega-3s, EPA and DHA. Is the concentration in there what is stated on the bottle? I'm going to measure, you know, f- so fish, it's being isolated. For, it's, it's, a, it's an oil. It's in the fat, right? So um, fish also have contaminants. They have PCBs. They have mercury, among others. And so measuring those contaminants is important because fish oil is generally purified, but you want to make sure a good job was done. So those contaminants are measured. And then um, oxidation. So omega-3s are a polyunsaturated fatty acid prone to oxidation. And so you don't want to get something that has an oxidation greater than 10. So anything greater than 10 of total oxidation, you want to avoid because it's like consuming rancid fat, right? Rancid lipids. Like you don't want to do that. So so you, those things are all measured and um, there's sources out there. So Consumer Lab is a you know third-party testing site that, you know, they just, I, there's a lot of affordable brands that you can find because some supplements are just very expensive. So I do like to kind of send people there because I have no affiliation with Consumer Lab, by the way. I just like that. I, I like I use them. So I like that you can go and find a, a pretty decent quality fish oil supplement. If you're a data nerd like me, you can take this up a level and you can go to the International Fish Oil Standards site, IFOS. They just, I mean, it's like data party. Like they give you so much data, but like you have to like know what to do with it. So they measure all these things, but like at everything else, right? Um, and they also tell you the form it's in. So I mentioned ethyl ester for the prescription form. There's also triglyceride form. Those are the two main forms that you can find fish oil supplements or omega-3 supplements in. And um, 
generally speaking, triglyceride form is is the most bioavailable. Triglyceride form is what is the form that if you're eating fish, the, the, the omega threes are in triglyceride form. When the omega threes are purified, they take it out of the triglyceride form and they purify it, and it's in an ethyl ester form. Some companies then reesterify it back into that form to make it supreme and more bioavailable. Both pure and bioavailable. Exactly. But not everyone does that. And so if you get an ethyl ester form, which is what is prescribed, most people that are getting prescription form of omega-3 to help prevent cardiovascular disease, they're taking ethyl ester form. That's what I've got. The thing to know is you have to take it with a meal and preferably with a higher fat meal because it is absor- it, it, you will absorb so little if you're taking it on an empty stomach. It's very important. And um, I didn't want to get into all the nuance, but I mentioned two grams a day of omega-3 will raise your omega-3 index from low to high, right? 4% to 8%. Well, if you really kind of look at the form people were taking, triglyceride versus ethyl ester, you know, they had to take, you know, less of the triglyceride form to get there. But so I like to just average it out and say two. But um, so if you can get triglyceride form, it's, it's a great form to get. How much salmon or cod or halibut do I need to eat per week if I was going to try and get this through my diet? Right. I mean, that's that's a question that I don't have empirical data to back up. But I'll, so, so here's my sort of thoughts on that. Um, I do think that wild Alaskan salmon is one of the best sorts of omega-3 because um, that is a fish that has a very low level of contaminants like mercury, um, PCBs per gram or per ounce, I guess is usually measured per ounce of the, of the fish, right? So salmon would be a great source. Now, how much of that do you have to eat? Uh, it's really, you know, depends on the cooking method. Like how how cooked was it? Because you can degrade some of the omega-3s. They are somewhat heat sensitive. So I don't know how much you, you would have to do a test, right? So you'd have to say, okay, I typically eat salmon two nights a week or three nights a week. And, and then you want to wait 120 days, right? <laughs> because it takes that long for your red blood cells to turn over. Okay. I know. Here's the protocol. Rhonda, just, just tell me how much salmon I need to eat. Come on, please. Um, well, I, w- I don't know. I twice can't, a week? You know, at least. At twice. least. Okay. I, w- I would say you probably have to supplement on top of that. I don't know that twice a week is nef- necessarily going to go from 4% to 8%. Got you. But if you were to do, you know, I, I would imagine a lot of the people that care about this, listening to this protocol will think, right, I'm going to find a good quality, uh, low oxidation triglyceride version of omega-3s that are responsibly sourced that I like the look of. I'm going to take two grams of that per day, and I'm probably going to try and have some sort of fish meal twice per week. Does that seem realistic? That's absolutely. That's kind. Of, that's what I do. I mean, I did it. I'm, that's what I... I do. I it. do up the dose a little bit more, but like I said, you know, I like eat it. Like I take it throughout the day. The omega threes. 